dear colleagues, dear students, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very honored to be here in Belgrade as, in, as an invited from Finland. I happen to be from for the first time in Serbia, so I have a lot of interesting things to discover. I had an uncle who was something of a diplomat, and he, a long time ago he was in, in Tito's time in Belgrade, and he told me all, all kinds of exciting stories of this country, now I have the opportunity to explore myself learn something new perhaps, so uh, if I don't attend all the lectures, you can guess that I have been going to the museums and places like that to study Serbian culture. If you would like to follow my track, you could think of me as a satellite that you have sent into the higher dimensions, namely <coughs> higher than what. In this room we are safely in a three-dimensional space. We have a, a, a width for this space, a length for this space, and a height for this space where we are in a three-dimensional room. But if you want to think of me as a point in a higher dimensional space, let's say in an n-dimensional space, you can you start by attaching some coordinates to me, so when you have the three spatial coordinates, I can move forwards and backwards, I can move to the right, and I can move to the left, and, and jump! <laughs> uh, but, uh, I mean, for a mathematician, higher dimensions are no mystery. You can have a function that depends on a parameters, and if you uh, construct this graph, it will be a graph in n plus one dimensions. So, for instance, to me, you could attach, uh, you could think of me as a function of n variables. You could attach to me, let's say, variables like like my body temperature or my blood pressure or my weight or my annual income. That's not very big <laughs> figure. And uh, if you construct a, a function of n variables. It would, be, it would be living in the higher dimensions. So I will skip all that kind of simple ideas about n-dimensional spaces. I will also take for granted the idea that we can think of time as the fourth dimension of the reality where we live. I mean, 100 years ago, 1915, to be precise for general relativity, Albert Einstein introduced a four-dimensional curved space-time, but I assume because <laughs> Einstein had special connections with Serbia, that's common knowledge here, that four dimensions is also a reality where we live. So what will I actually be speaking about? Well, my intention is to evoke some ideas about string theory. That's sort of, by now, old, well-established scientific theory as well, because string theory somehow got started 30 years ago when I was a young man. And actually, I experienced the excitement that there was in the early 1980s in the community of mathematical physicists when these wild ideas about elementary particles to be viewed as strings first came around. So, string theory is supposed to be a unified theory of everything. I mean, a fundamental theory of our universe, a fundamental theory about the fundamental forces of nature. And the underlying idea which has given the name to this particular theory is that elementary particles should not be viewed like points zero-dimensional objects in a space, but rather as extended objects which have an interior dimension, one in the interior dimension, so they appear like tiny strings in the Planck scale, I mean, on the lowest possible scale of the universe, uh, 10 to minus 35 meters where space-time itself somehow becomes 
fuzzy and uh, the, the various elementary particles that you discover in nature are supposed to be as uh, states, vibration states of the fundamental string, just like musical notes are produced by a vibrating violin string or the string of some other string instrument. And you can have a closed strings which appear like loops or open strings. Now, I'm something of a mathematical physicist, but you should not really believe that I'm a big expert on string theory. You can find better experts, as I'm sure, in the physics department of this university, or because in every country string theory is being studied. But there was a time when I wrote something about string theory. I mean, you are so young, most of you, that you were not even born when I was already thinking about higher dimension. That's my little paper a long time ago. As you say, see, it says, received July 27, 1987. I think most of, many of you were not even born in 1987 when I was already writing about higher <laughs> dimensions. And the title of my paper is The Einstein Field Equation in a Multidimensional Universe. That sounds <laughs> beautiful as a topic of study, and I've been going to these string theory conferences ever since. I even made the cover of the Der Spiegel once. This, this was the highest point of my mathematical career. For once I was in a very good company, as you see with Stephen Hawking and Edward Witten and all the greats. <laughs> and it says, Die klügsten Köpfe der Gegenwart entretzeln, was das Universum im in Innersten zusammenhält. So, <laughs> Actually, at that point, I told to myself, and that was back in 15 years ago, 1999, in Germany, I told myself that, uh, okay, better than this, I can never do. So it's uh, perhaps time to change my uh, study topic. And indeed, after that, I have uh, written another PhD in history of science. I'm now working mainly as a historian of science. Together with Dirk, we are editing a beautiful magazine the Mathematical Intelligence, this is a magazine of Springer Verlag devoted to philosophy of mathematics, history of mathematics, and also visual aspects of mathematics. And uh, both of us are editors, and actually this is an <laughs> issue that I'm particularly proud of, because this uh, girl on the cover who is representing the muse of mathematics, she is my niece. Thanks to Dirk who wanted to put her on the cover. Well, so I started by apologizing that I'm not anymore really actively working in string theory. But well, I'm still going to these conferences sometimes. And I was only a few weeks ago in Princeton in the string theory conference of this year, Strings 2014, and there were of the same people that I met with. 30 years ago, now they have grey hairs a little bit like myself. <laughs> but um, it was a very big conference with 600 participants from the string community. I can tell you that in that crowd uh, there are many people whose uh, non-understanding of string theory is on a much higher level than mine. Because uh, nobody really uh, deeply understands what string theory will tell us about the universe. By, by the way, here's the first example of the interaction between art and science, because this beautiful poster of our Princeton conference, that's drawn by Robert Dijkgraaf, who's a Dutch mathematician who is the chairman of the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. So he's both a scientist and an artist, as we should be. So these are the buildings of Princeton, and you can see that there's a smaller building there where somebody is sitting and with the lights on, and that's 112 Mercer Street. That is supposed to be Einstein's house, because he was in Princeton, and he was already thinking of the unification of the fundamental forces of nature. So what are those fundamental forces of nature? Well, we start with gravity. 
you know the laws of Newton that date from Principia Mathematica of 1687, and I don't need to explain to anyone in Serbia Einstein's general relativity because he lived in Novi Sad for a while. But this is the fundamental equation of general relativity. Next year there will be a lot of talk about that, I guess also in Serbia, because we will celebrate the centenary of general relativity. So on the left hand side of that equation you have uh, there's the Ricci curvature, there's the scalar curvature of the four dimensional space time, our universe. On the right hand side there's a tensor named T, which is the stress energy tensor, which represents the presence of matter in the universe. So as um, Einstein himself said about this equation, the left hand side is carved out of a uh, subtle marble. It's like a palace of marble, whereas on the, on the right hand side, there's, uh, there's, uh, it's made of wood. It's a wooden house, <laughs> because it represents matter. And uh, in broad terms, uh, an interpretation of Einstein's fundamental equation is that uh, it's a statement about the geometry of our four-dimensional space-time. There's a deep interaction between geometry and matter. I mean, geometry, the curvature of space-time tells to matter or to light rays or whatever how to move. And on the other hand, the, 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 the presence of matter the presence of some enormous bulk of matter like the sun tells to the universe how to curve. But I'm not going to lecture too much about that either. Let's make a survey of the other fundamental forces of nature. To our present knowledge, there are a total of four of them. I mean, besides gravity, you have a three forces that act between the elementary particles. I mean, the electromagnetism that we can encounter in our familiar macroscale world, the fundamental equations of electromagnetism, a certain unification between electricity and magnetism were created by James Clark Maxwell in the 1860s. And later on, people have discovered that there are also two other forces. There's the weak force and there's the strong force. Strong force is the, the force that binds uh, uh, quarks into protons and neutrons and so on, but, but that also binds protons and neutrons into the nu nuclei of the atoms. So the name is uh, well chosen because if you build an atomic bomb, it's the strong force that you release. And there's also the weak force that's responsible for the radioactive decay after an atomic explosion, for instance. And you want to unify all of these, so this has been done to some extent between these three forces and many Nobel Prizes have been awarded to theoreticians and experimenters who have worked on this topic. The fundamental concept for the unification of, the, of these three forces is the internal symmetry group. So to begin with, the electromagnetism, which is really a theory about light, can be understood as a theory somehow with respect to a one-dimensional symmetry group, namely the circle. Similarly, the weak force is to be understood as a theory with three intermediate particles, namely mm, that all of these intermediate particles should be uh, viewed as like um, some ping-pong balls if you are uh, playing ping-pong. I mean, they are constantly being exchanged by those elementary particles which interact with each other and they bind uh, so elementary particles together and for, for the weak force there are three of them, namely W, Y, uh, plus and minus and Z, zero. These were discovered in 1983 in CERN. There's also the strong force 
with eight intermediate particles appropriately called gluons, because they glue things together, as I told you. So the total number of dimensions of the unified symmetric group of a unified field theory up to this point would be 1 plus 3 plus 8, or 12. Well, you need to be a differential geometer to understand what I mean with the, the, the symmetric group G and the, and the structure called the principal bundle, principal G bundle over manifold. Okay, I'm only surveying these things, I'm not going to into, into too much mathematical details, but here are the gentlemen who in the 1950s first discovered the mathematical uh, formulation for this uh, theory as a field theory, just like Einstein's uh, uh, field equation of 1915. Uh, C. N. Young and Robert Mills discovered an action principle. You know, physics is where the action is. Uh, you can derive field equations by uh, minimizing um, Lagrangian uh, action principle, and they found the good formulation for this, just like Einstein's equations by the method of David Hilbert can be derived by minimizing the scalar curvature. In this uh, geometric uh, framework, you can uh, 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 derive the, or deduce the young mills equations by minimizing the total curvature of the principal G bundle, where G is a 12 dimensional symmetric group, and you get very simple looking field equations, and if you uh, apply this procedure to Maxwell's equations, you find the familiar, quite simple looking equations of James Clark Maxwell. So, this unification, especially between, the ele between electromagnetism and we the weak force, works very well, so you can speak of the electroweak force. But there are many problems, if you have a closer look at the zoo of elementary particles, according to our present understanding, nature consists of 61 different elementary particles. Here's the whole list of them. So, on the left, there are the quarks and the leptons, which are fermions, that's to say, which have half integral spin. There are six flavors of quarks. Each quark, comes, each quark comes in three different colors, and uh, there's also an anti-quark uh, corresponding to each quark, so that makes uh, six times three times two, that's to say 36 quarks. Then you have got the leptons, electron, muon, and tau particle, and they're co corresponding to neutrinos, and their and antiparticles, that makes 12 elementary particles. Then there are the intermediate bosons that I mentioned in the red, or the so-called Gates bosons, because they're in the Gates theory. So there are eight flavors of gluons, there's a single photon, and there are, uh, there are the Z and W particles, uh, the W includes its own antiparticle. So uh, this means 12 particles. And then there's the Higgs boson that was discovered with a lot of excitement one and a half years ago. So 36 plus uh, 12 plus 12 plus 1 makes 61 elementary particles. Now if you write down the young Mills Lagrangian action principle, including all the 61 particles, you get an expression like this. This is the quantity that you have to minimize to uh, deduce the fundamental equations of the so-called standard model that unifies uh, electromagnetism, weak and strong force. So this looks quite awful, doesn't it? <laughs> but, but there is a clear mathematical structure it, it's just the total curvature of the principal G bundle. But what is annoying for people who are looking for a fundamental theory?
theory of nature is that this gives beautiful, nice looking equations, but you can't deduce this, the values of uh, the fundamental uh, constants of nature, let's say the uh, velocity of light or the, uh, the magnetic fluxes with some Tesla or whatever. <laughs> this expression is arbitrary in that sense that it contains 19 parameters that just have to be adjusted by hand to get the results that you want. In other words, our universe appears to be extremely fine-tuned. That's to say, if you change the constants here, you will get beautiful <laughs> looking equations, but not quite a working universe. So, you can have uh, various philosophical considerations based on this observation. I mean, is our universe really finely tuned in the sense of an anthropic principle? But was there some creator who adjusted the 19 coupling constants and um, uh, scattering angles and just to have the right kind of universe? Or um, do there exist myriads of parallel universes and we just happen to be in the good one? Or, third possibility, perhaps this is not the last word of science, perhaps there is some underlying more fundamental theory, and that's of course the pretension of string theory. So, this, is, uh, this expression is all what you can do in our familiar four-dimensional space-time. Who invented, to begin with, the idea that there should be more dimensions than four? Actually, this is an old idea. It's already got started in the lifetime of Albert Einstein in the 1910s and so on, 1920s. There were three pioneers. I mean, in that time, people only knew about gravity and electromagnetism who wanted to unify those forces, at least in a five-dimensional space. And those early pioneers are here. They are Gunnar Nordström, Taylor Kaluza, and Oscar Klein. Gunnar Nordström was from Finland, Taylor Kaluza was from Russia, and Oscar Klein was from Sweden. So they all started thinking about five dimensional space and the unification of gravity and electromagnetism. And these so called Nordström, Kaluza, Klein models were fashionable for a while, but then people discovered actually, as I told you, more forces. And a better unification, so these ideas of a five-dimensional space fell into oblivion for half a century. Until they resurfaced again in the framework of string theory. So now let's go back to string theory. Let's say, modestly, bosonic string theory, which works for bosons. So I told you that strings may come up in two different shapes. Topologically, there can be a closed string, there can be an open string. And if you will think of their propagation in space-time, that could be four-dimensional, which, which could be higher dimensional. These shapes, as is common in Einstein's theory, they trace out not word lines, Weltlinie, but word surfaces, because they are one-dimensional, they trace out two-dimensional surfaces. Now, now, is this good for anything? Why, why not you simply deal with point-like particles as well as until today? But we will see that it's of some help of understanding. Namely, what you really want to do is to reconcile not only the fundamental forces, but the fundamental ways of looking at nature, namely, namely the classical theories, you know, Einstein's general relativity is a classical theory, and the quantum theories. So, uh, there's a general recipe uh, proposed by Richard Feynman to quantize some classical theory to pass into a quantum field theory. I mean, in quantum physics, you don't deal with certainties, but with probabilities. You don't really know how a particle got from one point to another point, but, um, you, deal, but you have to consider all the possible paths 
between those uh, points or states that the particle could have taken. And the only thing that you can say that there are probabilities, there's a probability distribution, there's a uh, probability amplitude. So you have to integrate over so-called Feynman paths, I mean, all the paths between the states Ta and Tb a few seconds later. Now this looks extremely complicated, but actually here we see, start seeing why string theory can be helpful as an idea. Because if you want to list out all the Feynman diagrams of particles that can interact, I mean, it can happen that um, a particle branches into several particles, as you see in particle accelerators, or that several particles fuse together. Here there are two incoming particles that fuse together, and there's only a single outgoing one. If you draw a classical Feynman diagram as on the left, this is difficult, because there's a bad point here. There's a similarity. I mean, think of integrating over something like that, and you will get into trouble. There's a way uh, of remedying this problem by so-called renormalization procedure. But the virtue of strings is that if you think of two closed loops coming in and fusing together, I mean, there's no bad point here. It's smeared out. I mean, there's not a single point where the brushing or the joining together takes place, but uh, uh, it's a smooth process. It uh, constitutes a nice, like, uh, nice looking like tube, two dimensional surface like that, and on surfaces like that you have uh, all kinds of mathemat mathematical machinery. Uh, because we know that complex analysis is actually much more beautiful than real analysis. I mean, nature often uh, uh, obeys uh, laws of complex numbers rather than real numbers, and on this kind of surfaces which you can think of as Riemann surfaces, you have a complex analysis available. Now, if you follow the procedure of Richard Feynman, you have to compute an integral, not, uh, not uh, um, on the space, an infinite dimensional space, of all the one-dimensional paths or diagrams, but on all these two-dimensional objects. So here's an example, I mean, there are three elementary particles coming in and they interact in many different ways in, a, in an accelerator just in the nature and they will come together and they branch again and there are four particles going out. But uh, as you see, this is a smooth procedure and you can deal with this, namely, uh, in a classical, very classical, complex analysis, uh, structures like this form a moduli space. I mean, the space of all such structures was already known to Riemann. It's called the Riemann moduli space. And it's a nice space because it is finite dimensional. I mean, the space of ordinary Feynman diagrams is infinite dimensional. There are as many paths as you can imagine if you want to parameterize them, but uh, this boils down to a finite dimensional space. More precisely, the Riemann moduli space does have some singularities, but it has a covering space called the Teichmüller space, which is just smooth and has a, comes with a, a smooth structure and uh, the measure and whatever, the most beautiful space. The name Teichmüller is given to this space according to a notorious German mathematician, but the name was coined by a Finnish mathematician, named, namely the Finnish Fields medalist Lars Alfors. And the dimension of this space over which you want to integrate will be, according to the theorem of Riemann and Roch, six times the genus of the surface minus six. So, for instance, in this picture, you have a, what, what does the genus mean? It means, for a two-dimensional shape, the number of handles. Uh, all those, uh, loosely speaking, the number of holes in the picture. And here, if you count, you have a 11 holes, so the corresponding moduli space will be 6 times 11 minus 6, or 60 dimensional. And then you have to integrate over it. And this leads to some fantastic 
conclusions about the real space where we are living, namely in bosonic string theory, the theory that deals only with the bosons that I listed before, the conclusion is that we live in a space of 26 dimensions. When I was a young man, 30 years ago, there was a lot of excitement. In 1984, when this was discovered, I am here, this is almost like a, a document. My own computations from that period when I computed, very excited, the number 26, we live in a 26 dimensional space. These papers are dated in the 1980s. Okay, I was in this conference in 1986 in California to learn about these things. And here again we somehow meet the, the world of art, because how do we imagine a space of 26 dimensions? No way. Just you can evoke somehow uh, that something fancy is going on. You can draw all kinds of artistic representations and maybe here's a 26 dimensional space and in the workshop I will show you some more. But why 26 dimensions? Of course it's a deep mathematical computation. I do have the computation here. Uh, but the Russian mathematician Polyakov in 1981 suggested a way of uh, studying string theory. He suggested that the, the action principle of a string propagating in, uh, in the background, Minkowski space, or in the background flat space should be just the Dirichlet energy of the surface. That's, uh, that's a very simple idea because that would give us classical solutions, the minimal embeddings, I mean the minimal surfaces, like the soap bubbles. But if you apply Feynman's quantization procedure to Polyakov's energy, what do you have to do? I told you, you have to integrate over the moduli, I mean the space of all such configurations. The, the MG uh, here corresponds to the moduli space of uh, genus G, that's to say surfaces which have G loops or holes or handles, as you like. And then uh, you have to integrate over all of the embeddings and you have to sum over all the possible genuses from zero to infinity. So this is a perturbative expansion and well, Polyakov's action is simply the Dirichlet energy which I have named S here. And this is a long but very beautiful calculation well, we are dealing with complex structures on two-dimensional surfaces and you want to have uh, this theory to be uh, independent of the, the representative of the structure that you pick. You also want to have it conformally invariant. And it so happens when you compute all this that uh, there appears a term of the form 26, when is the number of dimensions of the background space times the so-called Leo in action, which is non-conform. And then you just want to destroy or kill this non-conform part of the theory and you choose D to be 26 and that's it. Your theory becomes conformally invariant. This was the famous conformal anomaly cancellation 30 years ago. For mathematicians, there's a deep underlying reason for this. The Mumford isomorphism, which says that the canonical line bundle of the Riemann moduli space is isomorphic with the 13th power of the Hodge line bundle. That's probably too advanced, but 13 times 2 is 26. That's why we should live in 26 <laughs> dimensional space time from a point of view, algebraic geometry. Okay, this is good enough, but we only found a theory that has to do with the bosons. How do we get the fermions in? I mean, half of the interesting universe is made of fermions. The, what people have done is to introduce yet another fancy idea, namely that of supersymmetry. This was done ages ago. So supersymmetry is a mathematical idea that deals uh, with something called super variables and super manifolds and super everything, including super partners of the elementary particles. So these people want to stipulate that uh, for each elementary particle for nature there exists a super partner 
whose uh, spin is shifted by one half, so that bosons correspond to fermions and fermions really correspond to bosons. So not only do we have the 61 elementary particles that we know, but we should have an entire super world of 61 other uh, elementary particles, the super particles, but they have never been discovered. I mean, people have uh, now access to huge new research facilities, this large hadron collider in CERN, but people start worrying about, will we ever discover the super partners? This is the main issue of Scientific American, it says, a crisis in physics, question mark. If supersymmetry doesn't pan out, scientists need a new way to explain the universe, maybe. Okay, but for mathematicians, this is a beautiful idea, because we like symmetry, we would like to have a perfect symmetry between bosons and fermions, but maybe nature prefers broken symmetries. Uh, maybe it's more beautiful to have uh, a universe that is not in perfect balance. Uh, but these uh, particles, the super partners that are formerly called SUSI, have never been found. What are they good for? I mean, if you rewrite the theory that I just outlined for you, the bosonic string theory in terms of the super variables, you actually get something more, slightly more palatable. You end up in so-called super string theory, which only needs ten dimensions for our universe. Okay, ten dimensions. That, that sounds already better than twenty-six dimensions. So. If 10 is more palatable, we can start thinking what happened to the extra dimensions that we don't experience in our everyday reality. So there are 10 minus 4 of them, 6. Probably they are special dimensions, but actually in these theories also time could be many dimensions, and that's beyond human understanding somehow that you could also in time not only move forwards as we ever do, but you could somehow move sidewards in time. Well, the missing six dimensions are supposed to be packed in a compact structure that is referred to the Calabi Yau space. So attached to every point of our four dimensional universe, there should be an invisible one uh, containing six curled up dimensions. For specialists, Calabi Yau spaces, they are compact. Kellerian six manifolds with the vanishing first churn class. Actually, it's a deep theorem due to Calabi and Yao. Calabi is Italian, Yao is Chinese, that they carry vanishing rich curves. I mean, this is remarkable because you have seen the Einstein equations, there was the rich curves. I mean, these, uh, these uh, spaces, uh, Calabi Yao spaces, they are rich flat, so they are solutions to Einstein equations. This is, I mean, the reason why this theory, this 10 dimensional super string theory, is supposed to contain Einstein's theorem of gravity. So, this is supposed to be the unification of gravity and the other fundamental forces on a quantum level. That's, that's supposed to be a theory of a quantum gravity, according to Stephen Hawking. This is the only candidate that we have for a theory of a quantum gravity. There are various alternatives, but when well, Hawking is an authority in this field, and he says that this is the only one that he believes in. So, back to the art world. Here's a mathematical picture of a Calabi Yau space, a six-dimensional six dimensional space that is supposed to be attached to every point of our universe, and there's an animation. So, our universe really should look like that. We live, this is of course a simplification, the straight lines correspond to, uh, to the common Einsteinian space-time, a little part of it, I'm somewhere here, there are three special coordinates and that's to me and one time coordinate, but in reality, all around me, there's, uh, or every point of my body, there's a little Calabi Yau space containing the extra 
six dimensions that we don't see or experience. And here is a mathematical slice of a six-dimensional space. And but these are like works of art. You could, put, like, you could perhaps like to put that <laughs> on your wall. And many of the pictures of the superstring theory, they are mathematical pictures, but they are exceedingly beautiful as well. Now, how about the symmetric group of this enormous theory? I told you that the standard model unified with three forces only needs 12 dimensions for the gauge group, for the group G. And then there's gravity, which is supposed to correspond to a graviton, it's never been found, and that's, uh, that's one dimension four, one dimension plus, so 12 plus one would be 13 dimensions, but we have hugely more in this super string theory. We have 496 dimensions in the symmetry group. Pythagoras would be pleased because 496 is one of the perfect numbers that he studied. He would be somehow vindicated. He would say, okay, I knew it 2,000 years ago, or more than 2,000 years ago. 496 is a very special number. For mathematicians, it comes from a corresponding anomaly cancellation computation as the previous mysterious number, 26 or 10. Namely, when you want to cancel the gravitational anomaly, you have to live with the fact that, from the point of view of difference in topology, a 10 dimensional sphere has 992 uh, differential structures. I mean, it can have 991 so called exotic structures uh, besides the ordinary one that we are familiar with. And 1992 divided by 2 is 496. Now, if you have a 496 dimensional principle G bundle theory, you have to find out the Lie group of that dimension. And you look in your catalog of Lie, Lie groups, but there are not so many. I mean, you could have a, a circle to the 496 power, but nature is not made like that. It's too stupid as an idea. But what have you got? The special orthogonal group of order 32 is a dimension 496, as anyone can compute. But then you have also something else, namely among the exceptional league groups, you have an E8, the most beautiful of them, which is a dimension 248. And 248 times 2 is 496. And these are the alternatives to which people stuck 30 years ago when the so-called first string theory evolution took place. <coughs> but you can draw a very beautiful picture of this 246-dimensional, 248-dimensional exceptional league group E8. There was a lot of excitement in the media about this picture a few years ago because this is the um, root lattice of E8. Isn't it beautiful? Yet another purely mathematical picture that, but you, what would you would like to hang on your wall, perhaps? So to recapitulate, 496 is the mysterious number of superstring theory. It's also a perfect number as computed by Pythagoras. And essentially, there are only two alternatives for the fundamental symmetry group of our universe. And uh, this one, Moreover, it breaks into two, so perhaps there is uh, one universe and there's a mirror universe somewhere, somehow, it's simply we don't experience it. Maybe there are two copies of our universe. Maybe while I'm lecturing here, there's a mirror image of me lecturing in a mirror image room somewhere, <laughs> if this is true. And this is a picture to think about the structure of E8. Yes. Okay. Jacques Tietz made big contributions to his field. He's in Collège de France, but he's from Belgium. So, but actually, unfortunately, this is uh, almost even too good, because now we have beautiful ingredients. Like, I remember when I was a young man, 30 years ago, people were convinced, okay, that's it, we have found the fundamental theory of the universe, now we can compute the constants of nature out of this. 
I mean, Edward Witten himself made statements, okay, within a few weeks or a few months, we'll compute the velocity of light for you from these ingredients. But it's actually more complicated. For instance, we have a problem with the color video space. When people first discovered it, they believed that there's only one. Actually, there are millions of them. <laughs> So there's just an embarrassment of choice. I mean, there are, there, there's probably a finite number of them, but there are trillions, or I don't know how many. And then you have also this dichotomy between the two different Lie groups, and there are some other dichotomies. There's also the dichotomy between bosons and fermions. And this, uh, one wanted one single theory, but it happened, give me five five different versions of superstring theory uh, emerged. The so-called heterotic string, there are versions of it. By the way, according, uh, again we somehow fall back into the art world, because uh, these things were discovered by the so-called Princeton string quartet. A team of four physicists were working in Princeton, David Cross, Jeffrey Harvey, Emil Martinitz, and Ryan Rohn. And there are many people who don't really understand string theory, but this is so nice. String quoted, so every time when there's a documentary movie about strings on TV or whatever, there's some beautiful string quoted playing there in the background. We can explore this as well in our workshop. Well, the leading theorist Today, of all these theories, Edward Witten, he was of course there in Princeton, he's supposed to be somehow like Albert Einstein of today. He's a Fields medalist and he has the highest bibliometric Hirsch index in the world. You are too young to compute your Hirsch indexes, mine is very low, but he has the highest one in the mathematical sciences, I mean the highest citation index in the world of all times, higher than Einstein had. In the humanities, people like Karl Marx and Sigmund Freud, they have a higher than him. But, <laughs> but I mean, it's incredible. He's, he's a very modest man. I met him in the gardens of Princeton. I asked him, where does the Higgs boson get its mass? And he was so kind that to stupid Finnish mathematician, he started giving a long answer there. <laughs> I mean, he's very accessible. He's modest. He's unassuming. I mean, we have uh, people who are so full of themselves, <laughs> who appear on TV as experts or whatever, or communicators of science, but he's the uh, most famous theoretician of, of it all. But many people don't even recognize his name. I mean, everyone knows Stephen Hawking, everyone knows Albert Einstein, they have become icons of science, but not Edward Witten, who is somehow the greatest in the field today. And what did he do? So, I told you that there are so many different versions of superstrings, but he made this comparison that, that um, it's like um, the old story about uh, the Indian philosophers who they touched some unknown object. One touched uh, the, 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 some, something like fur here, and the other one touched the something hard here, and uh, another one uh, <laughs> it's trodding on my feet. And, Actually, they were all touching an elephant. One touched the tail of an elephant, one touched the tusk of an elephant, one touched its very long nose, and one patted its feet. But nobody realized that there's an elephant lurking behind. But then Witten in 1995, in a conference in Southern California, in the University of Southern California, makes a similar remark. He somehow unified the five sectors of superstring theory together with the sixth theory, which was sort of old-fashioned, so-called 11 dimensions of supergravity. And he suggested that there is really one bigger theory, like an elephant. And what we have discovered hitherto, I mean, there was this old theorem, Eleven dimensions of supergravity that I was not talking that much about. And there are the five different versions of superstring theory. There's the heterotic string with bosons and uh, fermions, the eight group twice, the S432 theory, and there are even three other versions. But he suggested that there's something 
even more mysterious, called M. M, this fancy of I'm a murder. <laughs> Nobody knows what M means in witness imagination. It could be magic theory or mystery theory or whatever. Some people say that actually the M should be turned upside down, and that M is really W for Witten. <laughs> but here is somehow where we have uh, stopped uh, uh, since 20 years. This observation was made in 1995. Witten has now grey hairs, and he, he's becoming like another Einstein. He's sitting there and wondering what this M theory might be. There's also an Iranian colleague, Kumran Wafa, who is in Harvard, who suggested that, uh, okay, the expense of this M theory is that you need one dimension more. The image that we can use is that you actually bring a ladder, you climb to a higher level and you see a so-called string theory landscape so that from a higher vantage point you realize that the previous theories, they are all manifestations of the same. But then there's this Iranian colleague who says that actually you need two dimensions more, that time also can have two dimensions, that makes a 12 dimensional universe. And that's where we have got. This is the so-called second revolution of string theory. That the first one was 30 years ago when I was a young man, I was very enthusiastic myself. Then there was this second string theory revolution 20 years ago. Now we are wait, simply waiting for some brilliant idea to have a more profound understanding of what M or F, they are like mother and father, could mean. I mean, the universe perhaps is not even, doesn't even carry the same dimension everywhere. It could be so that if the universe has parts and parcels that are four dimensions, some are 26 dimensions, some are 11 dimensions, and so on, there might perhaps even not be a single theory to uh, explain everything. There's one more guy who made a significant contribution. He's from the Argentine. Last night, the Argentinian football team didn't make very well, but when I was in Princeton a couple of weeks ago, he, this uh, the guy from the Argentine, Juan Maldacena, he made a lot of jokes that when he gave his lecture, that I hope uh, that I would be like Messi. <laughs> but he introduced yet another idea He's in Princeton as well, he's a student of Witten. Uh, in 1997, he uh, introduced one more idea, uh, namely that of a holographic universe. I mean, we have all the problems of understanding the role of gravity in the unified field theory. I mean, the gravity is so different from everything else because it's so weak. I mean, I'm a weak human being, but I can lift objects like this, I mean, or if I have a, a magnet, I can with the magnet I can pick nails or whatever. And there's gravity in the other direction. So, so gravity is actually it's simply piling up because uh, when there are very big masses around, but um, on the atomic level it's extremely weak. And so uh, what, what you need to unify all these theories uh, must be something incredible. Uh, but Juan Maldacena came up with the idea that perhaps gravity is just an illusion. It's uh, an illusion that comes from the, the, the fact that we really live inside a hologram. I mean, that the fundamental laws of nature, they really are on the surface uh, of the universe where we are. So he introduced this concept of duality. Duality, ADS, CFT. ADS is a reason called anti de Sitter. De Sitter was a physicist who uh, introduced some special solutions of Einstein's field equation. And so that's whatever it means, is a theory of gravity. And CFT is an abbreviation for conformal field theory, which is a theory of the standard model without gravity. And now this guy from the Argentine says that there's a duality between the two. That's to say that the same fundamental equations will work for both of these theories. Simply, uh, this theory has one dimension more than this theory. So, perhaps we live here in a four-dimensional space-time, or 26-dimensional, or 
10 times or 11 times or 12 times according to taste. But it could be that the gravity is just an illusion made by a magician, and the real thing is really only on the surface of our space. Uh, space with one dimension less. Maybe but it's a beautiful image and it's a beautiful new mathematical structure that he discovered. I'm almost at the end of my lecture. So we have had so many magic numbers and high dimensions, but no experimental proof whatsoever. The greatest research facility of, that mankind has ever built is the Large Hadron Collider that is now working in Geneva. In CERN. At least they discovered the Higgs particle, now they haven't discovered something like tetraquarks, so at least it's good for something, but they never discovered the supersymmetric particles. So we have no proof for the validity of, validity of anything that I have said. So is this all a dream? It could be just a pipe dream of some crazy mathematicians. It's a lot of mathematical beauty. There are the color Yau spaces, there are the uh, algebraic geometric results and whatever. So this theory has already left a lot of uh, traces in the history of mathematics. For instance, Edward Bitter is not a um, Nobel Prize laureate in physics, but he is a Fields Medal laureate in mathematics. So this is not only mathematical physics, but this is also physical mathematics. So, I mean, the intuition of physicists has had deep consequences in the development of mathematics. And even if string theory or M theory or F theory, if all of these theories would be wrong, there would be a math mathematical impact that will stay. But this is good for us artists, because um, as we don't have any proofs whether this is right or wrong, we can imagine, we can dream about this, we can make visualizations, and that will be the topic of my workshop. So there's a lot of room for fantasy. So my last slide is simply an invitation to the workshop. There I will speak for one more hour about how to imagine about these higher dimensional spaces. For that purpose, I would like to divide you into 10 groups because I have 10 different problems prepared for the third workshop and each group could try to solve one of the problems. If you are not too tired as professional mathematicians, I, perhaps even the professional mathematicians could join one of those 10 groups. And actually I would like to you to form the 10 groups now between friends. Let's break the whole, let's see. If you can form five groups here and five groups here during my next lecture or my workshop, I will give you ten problems. Maybe the professors can join forces. This is the end of my present talk. Thank you very much for your attention.